Okay, I think we're going to start. Welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, not real uh, great at doing this kind of thing, but um, I'm going to give it my best shot. My name is Joan Kowalski. I'm Vice President and Director of Operations of the Buster Foundation. Um, I've been doing it for rescue for over 15 years. And also I work in the medical field, so I've got some insight that way too, which helps enormously. Um, Diana McKay and I are going to be switching off a little bit here with certain segments of the presentation for you, and you can follow along with the um, presentation on the screen. We will have questions and answers um, afterwards because we do want to hear from you and um, elaborate a little bit more on any concerns or issues or thoughts you have. So please stay for that plus there's a little number on the back of the cards or some little packages that we have available for Okay. Uh, with that, here comes Diana. Hi, I'm Diana McKay and I run Wonderbowl.com. I do pimple education and I've been educating the public about pimples for about nine years now. I have about seven years experience in all breed dog rescues and for the last two years been concentrating on pimple education and uh, attending events and handing out free educational material and going to DSL meetings for free specific legislation uh, and I advocate for free neutral dangerous dog laws and I'm new to that so um, I'll be learning along with you at some point uh, but welcome welcome uh, today we'll be covering um, best practices for rescuing fostering placing pickles into appropriate homes uh, breed advocacy and responsibility. I will also discuss uh, breed, le uh, breed specific legislation, which we'll be referring to as BSL for a lot of this. If you have questions, we ask that you please wait till the end uh, during the Q&A session. And can everybody hear me okay? Mm -hmm. uh, we'll also be hosting uh, two roundtable discussions later today. Joni will be hosting a Pitbull Rescue uh, roundtable, and I'll be hosting the BSL roundtable, and they're both at 3.30. Uh, so at the same time. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, for purposes of today's session, so we're all on the same page, uh, when we use the term pit bull, uh, pit bull uh, refers to the three breeds that are typically uh, on, under that fall under that term when the public and the media uh, uses it. American Pitbull Terrier, American Staffordshire, and the English cousin, uh, smaller ones, which is the Staffordshire Bull Terriers. That's the Staffordshire Bull Terrier on that slide. Next slide, please. Let's take a quick poll. Oh yeah, that's, that's Mandy, that's mine. <laughs> For the little bit of grass left in the <laughs> Who's currently volunteering with the rescue that places pitbulls? And who's currently volunteering with the rescue that is not placing pitbulls? Uh, who's currently volunteering in a shelter that places pitbulls? And a shelter that does not place pitbulls? Any animal control officers here today? Oh, wow, quite a few. Great. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, well, oh, Ken, oh, that's another. That's Sydney. Oh. Uh, my, again. While we all may not agree on everything, it would be safe to say that we can agree on one thing. Breed's reputation, reputation is in our hands, now more than ever. We must make the right choices when rescuing and placing pit bulls, no matter how difficult those choices are. The future of these noble dogs depends on us. The grim reality is that there is a disproportionate number of pit bulls compared to other breeds in shelters throughout the country. Ideally, we'd love to see every animal rehabilitated and rehomed, but the reality is there's the supply far outweighs demand. It's important to know what your limits are. <laughs> <laughs> Foundation Volunteers House. <laughs> uh, but even more important to stick to those limits. Um, always best keep the dog's best interest in mind. Overextending yourself can have adverse effects on the dogs in your care. It's better to have less and do it right. I can't stress that enough. If you have the resources to take care of four dogs, you take care of four dogs. Headache, heartache, and tragedy are inevitable if you take on more dogs than you have the space or resources for. The dogs will always end up paying the price. As mentioned earlier, the breed's reputation is in your hands. For the last several years, 
Michigan has been a hotbed of activity for BSL proposals by legislators. We have a big fat target right here. Blame it on the media, irresponsible owners, backyard breeders, there's plenty of blame to go around. Uh, but every single negative incident involving a pit bull adds fuel to the fire. As advocates for these dogs, we cannot afford to be a part of that problem. It's important, that, which is why it's very important that every single dog that you put out there must be the best breed ambassador possible. This is Pitbull Rescue Central. For those of you that aren't familiar with them, they're excellent. Uh, dogs that demonstrate aggression towards humans, significant aggression towards other animals, should not be placed for adoption. I'm not talking, you know, as a little aggressive as dog. I'm talking raging on the leash, mm -hmm. raging in the cage, raging in the foster home, at anything and everything. Dogs with no bite histories should not be placed up for adoption. American Pitbull Terrier of correct temperament should be very people oriented, friendly even with strangers. That's okay. Very tolerant of physical handling. Um, dog aggression towards other dogs is common in pit bulls, especially between dogs of the same sex. Aggression towards other dogs is not a breed specific trait. Any breed can exhibit a lack of tolerance for other dogs. Remember that pitbulls are terriers, and many terrier breeds have dog aggression issues. And this is a direct quote from the AKC website. Terriers typically have little tolerance for other animals, including other dogs. <coughs> Ancestors were bred to hunt and kill vermin. Many continue to project the attitude that they're always eager for a spirited argument. <laughs> <laughs> That's the same place. <laughs> um, intolerance toward other dogs may develop as a pitbull matures typically between 10 months and three years of age. Just because a puppy is good with other dogs does not guarantee that all this be the case as the puppy matures, even if they grow up with the dog, uh, with another dog when they're a puppy. On the other side of that coin, some pit bulls that already exhibit, uh, that are already intolerant towards other dogs uh, may become a little bit more tolerant as they mature. Uh, each dog is an individual and should be treated as such. Uh, not all pit bulls become aggressive toward other dogs. And I stole this from PBRC and I know they let me do it because they let me do a lot of their stuff. Um, <laughs> but, uh, dog aggression, that is uh, aggression towards other dogs, complicated matter. Uh, like most things in life, it's not black and white. We should not think of dog aggression as a binary, either aggressive or not aggressive, but as a spectrum. Dogs can exhibit zero to dog tolerance, dog, dog aggression only in some situations, a high level of dog aggression, or dog aggression that falls somewhere in between those points. Mm -hmm. the, graphic below, uh, the graphic helps uh, visualize that concept. Again, not black and white. Shelters and foster homes uh, need to take a proactive approach in preventing dog fights. Prevention training monitoring is the key to keeping the peace between multiple dogs. Avoid problems by closely monitoring all interactions with other dogs, treat time, play time, toy time, and uh, training is essential as with any breed. It can help you diminish and manage any negative reaction towards other dogs that may arise in the future. Just to clarify, dog aggression is completely different from human aggression. The, uh, these are two completely separate issues, not related. Thanks to the media, the term aggression is used as a blanket statement. No matter what the circumstances, many people incorrectly assume that a dog that shows aggression towards other dogs will automatically show aggression towards people. This is simply not true. Correct temperament. As we mentioned earlier, correct temperament pit bulls should be very people oriented, friendly even with strangers, and very tolerant of physical handling. Pit bull displays aggression towards people is not a good representative of the breed. It's not normal for the breed. Should not be placed up for adoption. Indiscriminate breeding, we've got inbreeding, abuse, 
Any one of these can be a contributing factor to a dog showing aggression towards other people. Again, another PBRC quote I stole. <laughs> Dog aggression is a normal trait for the breed. Human aggression is not. I can't stress that enough. Biters should never be placed for adoption. Uh, this should be common sense. I have come across at least one rescue. They had some uh, dog bit a friend of mine at an event. At a bowl. And they continued to place the dog, despite our attempts to educate them. I don't know why all they're doing is setting the dog up for failure, further damaging the breed's reputation by putting a dangerous dog out there. The dog had already bitten another person that day. <coughs> and the, the uh, foster person had it on a leash and was continually telling people how friendly the dog was after it bit my friend. And I'm talking girl blood, not just a nip. And uh, I can't tolerate it. If you know somebody that's doing this, please. Uh, all rescues and shelters need to have the best interest of the animals in mind. Now just have their hearts set on keeping every dog alive no matter what the circumstances are. By placing a biter, you put the lives of all pit bulls in jeopardy everywhere. This bears repeating every single negative incident involving a pit bull it gives fuel to the fire from DSL. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, Joni's better half, Al. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, he also is uh, an animal control officer. <laughs> <laughs> Placing a human aggressive pit bull is irresponsible, period. <laughs> Leave a legal and moral application to the breed and the public. Don't put a dog out there it can do further damage to the breed's reputation. Don't risk everyone's right to own these dogs. Don't give pit bull haters more rope to hang us with. <laughs> the breed can't afford it. But there is an important note here. You cannot get a true feeling for an, of an animal's personality and temperament if they are not feeling well. If they are too laid back or aggressive, it could be due to underlying health problems. Establish that first. Turning it over to Joni. Oh, I, I wanted to make a quick note too. <coughs> the presentation will be made available after on um, our websites, Busters and Wonderbulls, as well as I believe on on the um, one topic that I wanted to really touch on with the bully community and actually the canine community at large is um, uh, Babesia, Babesiosis infections. There's a couple of different strains. Um, there's a large cell, which is the Babesia canis, and then the smaller cell organism, which is the Babesia gibsoni. Um, this is Capone. Sorry, guys. This is Capone, one of um, the first dogs, my first dog ever that I took into our group that tested positive for Babesia. Um, he, I rescued him off of a porch in Detroit, and um, needless to say, he was in horrible shape. He didn't, you know, we, we addressed the wounds and, you know, the um, infection and, and uh, the body condition, but it wasn't until a little bit later that we realized this dog um, from doing blood testing was a carrier for the easier gift selling. Typically, um, it's um, this, right, but this specifically, you're seeing more cases in the pit community because of the fact and propensity for fighting because it is transmitted by ticks and bite wounds from an already infected dog, which who knows about the home. It also can be passed in utero onto puppies um, if the mother is a carrier. I, have, um, I'm, I'm, I hate to interrupt. I've never heard of this condition. Right. Mm -hmm. it, and you, you know, I have on what it is. It's, it's a, a blood parasite. It almost, in, in layman's terms, I can tell you, and certainly you can talk to your veterinarians on staff, your personal veterinarians to get a more clear understanding, do some research online. Um, it is a blood parasite that <coughs> typically will affect the immune system. A lot of vets are seeing it and calling it immune-mediated hemolytic anemia. Mm -hmm. Dogs' symptoms vary, can mimic other diseases and illnesses. Um, 
this is healing on Capone about 10 days after I took him in. Um, he had to have multiple blood transfusions and the prospect of adopting a dog out with Babesia. Uh, the reality is that it is, since the bullies and the terriers have more of a propensity to want to scrap with other dogs, this can be transmitted by bite, by bite wounds and blood. Is it treatable or is it like FIV? Manageable. It's like FIV. It, it it's basically, manageable, but not right, it can be manageable. Dogs can be asymptomatic and not show anything. Um, and with Capone, you know, we were real busy addressing everything else, and not until he started his count, his counts went down. Um, let me just give you a little more here because I don't have it memorized in my head. Some of the symptoms, you know, include anemia, vomiting, lethargy, diarrhea. And you're seeing a very high prevalence in strays, dogs off, that are rescued off the streets that are going into rescue, um, and dogs with, you know, obviously wounds from fighting that had an, an obvious history, but not necessarily an obvious history. We've had females that came in with puppies that were carriers. Um, it used to, it used to be, and, and I'm assuming is still a case with greyhounds from down in Florida because of the tick bites, because it's transmitted that way as well. Um, it used to be rare, and it's not anymore. You're seeing no. it more and more. That's why you haven't heard of it. And the reason, yes, please. Is it somewhat similar to parvo then, or can it be mistaken for parvo? The symptoms, I mean, I've seen the symptoms be very vast and mimic a lot of other things. Um, example, um, yes, diarrhea, vomiting, you all become anemic, the gums are white, anorexia, um, weakness and you know a multitude of other symptoms it can certainly mimic other diseases and and viruses and such so the only shortcut way to test for it a lot of veterinarians used to do slides and just do a blood smear it's not reliable enough anymore you really have to go ahead and with the poem what we did is we did a what we call a pcr titer that was sent up to state and you know not all dogs that are tested positive for babesia will show the symptoms obviously but they can still infect other dogs. Um, according to Best Friends Animal <coughs> Sanctuary, one half of the big dog <coughs> went into the sanctuary, tested positive for Babesia. Mm -hmm. um, but only one came down with overt outward symptoms. Okay. That was on the dog Right, right. They had no clue. Right. 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 Um, although research, research isn't conclusive, mm -hmm. it's believed that there's isn't really a cure for Babesia in this country. Once the animal's infected, it'll carry it for the duration of its life. Um, there are medications out there that can manage the symptoms, alleviate the discomfort, transfusions and such. And I struggled with wanting to present this at all to put everybody into an hysterical state, thinking, oh my God, you know, what if, what if, what if? And um, I can tell you that since I've been doing this, I have tested, I have had eight dogs test positive for this. One being my own that I had for eight years that finally, I finally lost her to cancer and renal failure, but we didn't know she was a carrier of Babesia until we did further diagnostic testing. We're trying to treat her with chemo. So the reason that I bring it up is obviously that you, we have to be careful about the dogs that we bring into our shelters, into our homes, um, into the general population with other dogs. Uh, it, it's a scary thing. I, I had one volunteer about a year and a half ago, we worked to save two dogs that were living in a backyard in Detroit, just had nominal scar, scarring from playing with each other, male and female, opposite sex. And I was so scared that I told this volunteer, I said, we can take them in, but I want you to know that if it's Babesia, these are gonna be long-term you know, have to be managed totally separate or should be for the most part from the general population. And she took them in the next day and um, they were positive. So even though they had no outward symptoms, their weight was great, they were bright, alert, responsive, interactive, good body condition, um, not so with Capone and that, that was him again convalescing. Um, the epidemiology of this is changing too. I'm, oh, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Capone. He was diagnosed while he was in foster care, and obviously we did the gamut, multiple antibiotics, fluid, blood, these have two blood transfusions, 
um, you know, organ failure, which did damage his kidneys. He lost a kidney to cancer. We did remove that kidney, and he lived another five months after that. Um, the, the foster home that took him, she was a wonderful gal, and I have to add this about this dog in particular because Capone raised, when I say raised, literally raised a litter of 10 puppies that we had. Uh -huh. This dog was a better mother and caregiver to that, those 10 puppies from the time they were nine weeks old till almost two months. Um, he laid in the backyard, dug holes, they jumped on him, they chewed on him. Um, he was just a phenomenal, phenomenal dog, and this, this one tugs on me still to this day. And, um, but, you know, the... Pardon? No, no, it's, it, it, it's actually blood transmission bites, or like I said, through ticks and that kind of thing, too. And the epidemi epidemiology is changing. It's not just tick-borne, obviously, it's blood now. Mm -hmm. Studies in North Carolina, prevalence in pit bulls was 6.8% and the lowest infectious rates in the kennels that they surveyed, 25% um, in the highest kennel in the survey, and um, lack of ticks in these kennel situations because the dogs do an expert job of um, trampling down vegetation because most of these kennels are in barrels chained to chains, they're circling, they're digging up vegetation. So what they were uh, trying to determine is how else were they getting it. Now the, um, and they, they did test positive um, and they didn't even have a tick, his, tick by history because of that. A lot of this research was done by a Dr. Adam Birkenhauer who actually helped us with Capone and devised his treatment protocol um, some years back, Dr. Birkenhauer had stated that he had an 80% cure rate for this, but some of the medications and treatments available are not here in the United States. So um, one of the medications that you had to um, treat them with can be purchased here, but it's not the ideal drug of choice. It's the best, best thing we've got going to help minimize you know, the, the disease and the symptoms. Um, the diagnostics are expensive. I mean, the PCR titers um, up to state can range anywhere between 80 and maybe $100, depending on your veterinarian and the charges. Um, most of us, the shelters and even the rescues for sure, can't afford that. And with me working in the vet medical field, I, I saw it and I was concerned about it, but I was afraid to start telling people that, you know, Buster had eight plus dogs that had this, so <coughs> I didn't want to start spooking everybody and wanting everybody to go, you know, say, oh my God, well, you know, if this dog is tore up, I, they still deserve a chance, but my point with this is that perhaps when you take a dog in that may be questionable, that you should try to get permission from your shelter or, you, you know, the, the medical staff there to consider doing this, just, just so you know. Um, because it is out there. Um, do you test all of, do you by um, a policy now test all of your animals? We don't, we don't. You just um, use your judgment? I, I've used my judgment. Um, at some point, I would like to test all. Capone, for example, since I've been doing this, I can honestly tell you that <coughs> I believe in the 15 years in living in the city of Detroit and moving out to Belleville, I may have had three to five dogs that were fighting dogs. And when I say fighting dogs, I'm not talking necessarily coming from a ring. Capone was left, uh, you know, a neighborhood, uh, on a neighborhood porch. I've taken a couple dogs out of some of the parks down in Detroit. The other one, Tank, tested positive for Babesia Gibsoni shortly, shortly after we got Capone from a different area of Detroit, but nonetheless, the city. Um, so, you know, it's expensive, but if I have reason to believe where there's you know, uh, regular blood work it looks bad or platelet counts are low and that kind of thing, I certainly would have it done, just just to know. Um, you said uh, some dogs with just carriers not all have symptoms, but those that right. do have symptoms, what are the common symptoms? Um, lethargy, anorexia, vomiting. Were these skin issues anything to look for, or was that something else altogether? Well, these were bite wounds. This dog oh, was, okay. yeah, he was... Okay. 
torn up. He was abscessed and they had secondary pyoderma skin infections. Um, Those were unrelated yeah, to that. Right. Okay. So, you know, it, it, it looks a lot like a lot of other things that we still need to be worried about and be concerned about, but more so with, you know, with this being the kind of disease that it is and out there and not necessarily in every dog that's beat up. Uh, I, I will tell you, I tested two dogs, and one is going to be in a picture here within the last couple of months because I was concerned of the condition. Lacerations <coughs> all over the legs, um, abscess healing wounds, you know, missing hair and stuff. They were negative, thank God, but I did test them because <coughs> I just, I didn't want to, I didn't want to go that way. So this is definitely a big concern for the rescue community, the shelters, and, you know, people need to be aware of that. Obviously, it's not just exclusive to pit bulls, but that's where you're seeing it at in the majority of the population. Um, you know, you have to actually, please go based on what your veterinarian recommends. You know, share that with them, your concerns, and see if they will look at it through that avenue. I think it could, it, you know, can only help to educate you and in the long term be able to put these dogs in homes, you know, and and make sure that they get the proper treatment and that kind of thing. Um, whether you work with a rescue or a shelter, it's important to have realistic expectations about placing the pit bulls <laughs> that are in your care. Um, it can average six months or longer. And, um, you know, it's the, the other thing that happens with that is the dogs are aging too, so nobody wants to look at a middle-aged adult or an older adult, although I've got to tell you we had really great luck in the last few months with some of my seniors getting adopted. Um, a couple of them were seven to plus eight years. We've got another one that's looking to go now too. So I'm very thrilled and grateful for that. Um, What's the lifespan? You know, even though buster dogs get great medical care, I'm going to say I'm averaging eight, eight years maybe. But remember, these are dogs that are coming in that haven't had a fair shake, the majority of them. You know, in utero, poor nutrition. Um, you know, the indiscriminate breeding leads to orthopedic problems, renal, renal uh, failure. Um, they have a lot of uh, problems with the skin and mast cell tumors, which I'm constantly re having removed off of multiple dogs all the time. <laughs> and mine are nine so, and ten. I've heard of them living up to 16, but that's rare. Yeah, I wish some of mine, my personal dogs, who actually have gotten the best okay. medical care available, I, I lost two of mine at eight years old um, in this last year. Okay. And then as far as foster home um, success, what we're looking for is who's going to hang? Who's going to be in it for the duration? You know, everybody wants to, that's foster dad, Scott, and Raven. Um, you know, everybody wants to take a puppy. Everybody wants to help. And then when issues start arising, people start to get, they doubt their abilities. And, um, they get scared. They get frustrated that, you know, they're seeing this behavior, whether it's digging, jumping, nipping, bothering the other dogs and that kind of thing. So, you know, it goes with the territory. We, we're trying to find out who's going to be reliable and in it for the long haul. Who will do the follow, you know, will follow through. Will they be able to handle puppies through adolescence? Um, when they can't handle the dog anymore, when are they going to bail on the dog? And I have this happen a lot. Um, and it's real disheartening because that means the majority of these dogs that get bailed on come to Al and I. And I have 16 at my house right now. Um, some of them are mine, but uh, and not all are kids. Yeah. Um, you, know, you have to know every foster, every foster home is committed to the dogs that they take into their care. Obviously, you've got to educate them. You've got to provide support and education for them. Stress that long-term fostering is definitely a commitment. We're counting on them. Um, they have to understand the pros and cons, cons of fostering a pit bull. Be proactive in the responsibility that goes along with having those dogs in their home. They can't skimp on educating them and being a constant support to them when problems and issues arise. 
Um, candidates for fostering should have a, a good working knowledge of the breed, definitely. I mean, that only helps. And be accepting of the breed's challenges, which there are. Um, you've got to have someone who's willing to listen to advice and not be afraid to ask questions or voice concerns with the dogs or puppies they have in their care. Um, if, and supervision, obviously. <laughs> this is there to be extreme restraint. Um, and they all were foster failures for this family. <laughs> <laughs> and they are wonderful dogs. Um, if dog aggression starts to become an issue, the foster home's got to be prepared that they may need to permanently separate these dogs by the crate and rotate method. Um, and people, they don't want to listen to that. They want all the dogs to just be able to get along and run in a pack. And obviously you're going to be set up for failure. The dogs are going to be set up for failure. It can happen with some, somebody that has strong leadership skills and is right there to nip it in the bud. But, you know, a lot of times it's more work than the average or novice pit bull owner wants to put into. And then when it happens, it shakes their resolve a little bit. They're like, oh, I can't believe it happened. They've ate out of the same bowl for six months. You know, they've been in the backyard and playing and, you know, then they're devastated. Then they become unsure of themselves, and I can tell you that the dogs pick up on that. If you don't, if, you, if you're not able to continue to stay calm and transmit that to the dog, that creates a whole other set of problems for you. Um, no, amount, no amount of temperament testing um, in the beginning can determine the possibil possibility of a future dog's compatibility issues. It just, it won't happen. Um, good training, prevention, supervision is the key to avoid avoiding these kind of problems. And I tell all of our foster homes, you don't, I don't want you to say, oh my God, I've got to go out in the yard and spend an hour training Toby. I think that it's more realistic to say I'm going to take five to ten minutes multiple times a day and right, because the dogs will get bored with it too. And you want to end it on a positive note, not letting them sense your frustration that they're not getting the sit or the heel or the, you know, come when the recall or leave it or whatever it is. So if you leave it on a note where you see something tangible and positive with this, that's empowering to you and that will transfer to the dog as well. So short, multiple sessions a day, I think, are, are key. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Sure. In our group, we, we um, whenever we have a pit bull, typically, um, and they're young, and they're in foster care, we try to send them to daycare to help with socialization at a younger age. And do you think even with socializing them at a very young age with multiple people and dogs, that they can still later, when they hit the two to three year mark, are suddenly going to turn dog aggressive? Well, they can. And I think, I think I'm, I'm not a big advocate of dog parks. Um, I'm not a big advocate of daycares. I think for small puppies, it has definitely some benefit. I would urge everybody that considers it, though, to make sure that they're fully vaccinated. Can we get somebody to maybe turn the air up in this room? It was on a while ago, but I, I think a lot of us are getting a little bit hot. Um, and it's not, it's not a sudden thing. You know, it happens over and you'll have small little scraps. You so know. it doesn't really matter if it's you're not all it that It helps. It helps. Right. It, helps. It, can enhance, <coughs> it can enhance the, the social, to enhance the social experience of a puppy or a dog is, all, is paramount. And right. that needs to con continue for the duration of owning this dog. Um, I know many people that have taken them into daycare. And then, you know, against me, my suggestion, Tony, he got kicked out because he obliged <laughs> another dog. Well, you know, that's where I say too, you're setting these animals up for failure. I don't need to prove to anybody that I have wonderful dogs. I know their limitations. I know what they're capable of. I don't underestimate them. I don't set them up for failure. Um, if you're lucky enough to have your pit bull or bully mix get along with one or two other dogs, be, be happy with that. They don't need to run in big packs and they need me. Everybody seems to think that they need that. And unfortunately, I will argue every time with anybody that does, especially when it comes to pit bull. Thank pit bull. you. Here. Um, this is one of the, my little litters. This is Peaches. 
was a litter that I rescued off the streets of Detroit at 10 days old, a litter of eight, we lost one. I lost my hair and 18 pounds. <laughs> them, bottle feeding and tube feeding them. But the seven made it and the seven got adopted and this is her, her brother who is a master. Um, and always, you know, you need a backup plan if something falls through.